All right. By now we know what that sound means. It means Lisa's going to talk for a second. Good morning. Good evening. Good afternoon. Wherever you are joining us from around the globe, we are so pleased that you're here. Thank you for echoing my, my sort of jazz hand gestures there. <laughs> uh, so pleased that you're here. Um, so we are getting set to start our research theme day of uh, Shift Ed, and that's what we're going to start with this panel this morning. Um, we have a fantastic panel full of panelists who are talking about sustained research, which I think is something for those of us who do research, we might be wondering, how do you do that? <laughs> so we're going to dig into that this morning or afternoon or evening, wherever you are. So a couple of housekeeping things. You've heard me say them, but I'm going to say them again. We are recording the session. So if you have any issues with that or you don't want to show your video or you don't want to be a part of the recording, this is your chance to kind of pull out. Um, but we are going to post all of these sessions to our YouTube channel so that everybody can watch them over and over and over again, way into the future. Um, so that will happen. And then also please do note that the live transcript feature does work. So if you find you would, would like to have closed captions, um, that is something that is available to you for the session as well. So with that being said, I welcome you to our session on sustained research. Please welcome our community moderator volunteer who is here with us this morning, which actually it's evening where she is, uh, Zainab Bastuala. Um, so she's going to help us out with um, the chat and kind of all of the question and answer period. So please be watching out for her. Um, and then what I'm going to do now is pass it over to Mike Zender, who will introduce the panel. So thanks, everybody. Hi, everybody. Mike Zender here. I'm, uh, uh, I'm the editor of Visible Language and Professor Emeritus at University of Cincinnati. It means I'm old and retired, and I get to do whatever I want on uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, not just on the weekends, right? So that's what retired means. Every day is Saturday when you're retired. Um, I, the, the kind of the reason for this topic and the session is that in 2003, I fell into a research topic when Procter & Gamble wanted to know uh, and wanted to fund some research and how they could make their product instructions work on their packaging without using words, just using icons and pict pictograms. And so that that started me on design uh, on uh, researching pictograms and icons uh, the, and research that's still going on for me. And, and I used fell into kind of advisedly, you know, advisedly. Uh, I, 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 I didn't pick that topic, you know, I, I was interested in it, I had designed them, but I didn't pick it, I just sort of fell into it. And I think a lot of people fall into their research topic that way. They had it, an advisor in their graduate program did it. I, I fell into it. And so I, I, I've come to of the, have the opinion that um, we need sustained research, and we need it on important topics. And uh, and so because I'm a child of the 60s, I'm sort of rebellious. I'm suspicious of top-down authority. I don't want some top-down authority telling me what the key topics are and what sustained research should be done in. Uh, at the same time, I'm a designer, so I don't think things, it's best for them just to happen haphazardly. So having some design or some reason or rhyme or reason to research topics is good. So for that reason, uh, we've conducted today and, and it's available online, we're conducting a survey so that the community will generate uh, not only this conversation around what sustained research programs are and how they work, but also what, what important topics are. So there's a survey available. I think the link will show up in your chat. Uh, we've already had about 30 responses to it. And uh, we'll be sharing the responses uh, toward the end of our uh, in, in the latter third of our time today and uh, the responses to the survey. And there's going to be a special issue of visible language in the first quarter of 2022 about the topic of sustained research and what are important topics that really need or should have sustained research and design. And again, because I'm suspicious of authority top down. Uh, it's hopefully the, the key topics about sustained research. It's going to come from the community of designers. So with that, I just introduced the three panelists. Uh, start with Anne Besmans. She's uh, uh, from the University of Haslett, and she's going to be talking about her research, sustained research program. And then Renee Seward, 
is going to talk about her sustained research program, and then Matt Wazinski is going to talk about his. And I've already talked longer than I intended, but they'll each talk for about 10 minutes, allow five minutes for discussion, and then we'll have about 15 or 20 minutes to discuss their presentations overall, and then we'll go to, go to a, a, a Moreau board and, and talk about what we found out through the survey about sustained research programs and with that. And um, take it away. Uh, thank you, Mike. Um, I, I changed positions because my, my internet uh, connection is very unstable. So I hope that uh, I can um, give the presentation how I <laughs> uh, prepared it. Uh, okay, so if everybody can see my, my screen uh, and hear me loud and clear. Okay, uh, so first of all, I would like to thank Mike Sander for inviting me to participate in this presentation and this panel uh, discussion based on the interview from a few months ago. And secondly, I would like to thank the organizers uh, for inviting Mike Sander, the editor of Visible Language, to share the promotion of the urgency of sustained research programs. So thank you very much. And before diving into the perspective, which is based on industry and government funded scientific uh, reading research, I would like to grab the opportunity to introduce myself and my research program very briefly. So in this short presentation, I will um, overlook like five short uh, items uh, and let's start with the, with the introduction. Uh, so I'm Professor uh, Dr. Anne Bessemans. I am a legibility researcher and a typographic uh, and type designer. I founded research in 2015 and this is a legibility group at PXL Med uh, School of Arts and Hasselt University where I also teach typography and type design. I'm also the program director of the International Master Program Reading uh, Type and uh, Typography. And um, I received uh, my PhD from Leiden University and Hasselt University under the supervision of late Professor Dr. Gerard Unger. And I'm also currently a member of the Data Sciences Institute at Hasselt University, the Young Academy of Belgium, uh, the Reflection Group Art, Science and Technique at the Royal Academy of uh, Belgium, and I'm also a lecturer at the Planta Institute of uh, Typography. Um, so research, what, what, what is research like this research lab? So research uh, explores the borders of legibility uh, or re readability within several research lines. And those research lines, they might interact with each other. Uh, research investigates different uh, topics and focuses on uh, several target groups. Research also aims to develop practical and typographic legibility and readability studies within a new conceptual framework concerning typographic design, which is based both on mac uh, micro, macro and micro and micro, uh, uh, macro uh, level. So uh, comprehensive legibility research uh, takes uh, into account both the requirements of scientific methods and typographic practice. And as a fundament, research has derived in intrinsic properties of typography that influence legibility and or readability. And these can be described and studied in terms of form, rhythm, and movement, heterogeneity, and gives rise to innovative ways of designing and teaching both within graphic design as well as typography and type design. And to illustrate this abstract description, you can see here on this slide an example of test materials in which the rhythm of a typeface, which is the pattern of the vertical strokes that the letters cause, is studied by means of findings on improved legibility by means of irregular rhythms. And not only looking at differentiation in, for example, the letter shapes takes new ways it also takes new ways in experimentation in educational projects, for example, taking irregular rhythms in uh, educational projects with students that lead to um, more experimental typefaces, but with legibility uh, concepts. Um, Within uh, research, various legibility research projects, science always forms a, a great source of inspiration. And on the one hand, because the research material demands well-founded scientific support, 
And on the other hand, because exactly this supports induces valid practical uh, applications in the design originating during and after the research. And researchers within research are design researchers, what means that they are typographic designers who combine scientific research with design and who base design decisions on results of accurate and traceable empiric research. research. And this means that we are trying to link the objectivity of scientific research with the sensitivities of design. What I mean with this, with the creativity, with the in, uh, intuition, with the visual, uh, visual judgments. So in other words, we are trying to connect the artistically reflective and the scientifically uh, analytical uh, aspects. As research is linked to PXL Math School of Arts and the Hasselt University, it also shares an educational program in graphic design. And since 2016, I am the proud program director of the International Master uh, Reading uh, Type and uh, Typography. And this master is centered on creating self-initiated projects by students in the field of typography in relation with the research about legibility or illegibility within uh, the research lines of inquiry. For example, you see here um, students Walda Verbana and Janneke Janssen who had their own uh, self-initiated projects but within uh, some of the research lines of, of research. Touching upon an educational program within this research-based lab within the aforementioned institutes is, in my opinion, inherently linked to the industry. As design researchers, we are concerned about what the graphic industry needs when it comes down to legibility and to reading research or their practical implementations for, uh, of, of this. So the last decade, a lot of research has been conducted by linguists, educationalists, and psychologists to make type more, read, uh, more legible. But unfortunately, there exists a little cooperation between the typographic practice and the experimental scientific research. And this is uh, confirmed by uh, the, the following. Um, so the fonts that are used in these scientific studies do not meet the requirements of good typography and professionally designed fonts putting into question the validity of these scientific results. Second, uh, the scientific results do not always reach the designers who shape the characters. The designers, they also rely on intuition when approaching legibility matters. And designers, they are not very familiar with setting up and conducting reading and legibility research. And in that sense, also designers barely read about legibility studies unless the results are mentioned in design manuals. The poor collaboration between the scientific and the typographic parties considerably affects the value of legibility and reading research and the designed outcomes to improve legibility in printed or digital matter. And in order, in order to change the current state, the skills from the two communities needs to be united. Um, education that is enforced by means of design research is a strong tool for reaching awareness and the goals by means of educating academic design students in, a, uh, in another way. Typography has so many connections with interdisciplinary scientific fields and is of high importance for various graphic graduation specialisms in order to broaden horizons and seek innovations within. It's only since seven some years that the practice of typeface and typographic design has become an established field of an academic study in which it's also growing in recognition in the cultural mainstream in the academic field and is able to seek for academic merit. Furthermore, typeface and typographic design is expressing the research in terms that the general public can engage with. And in Europe, this was uh, also the case because academic studies in design and the arts only start within, uh, with the Bologna process in 1999. So I was one of the first design students at my institute to start with a PhD. And of course, for me, this meant being exposed to various other and interdisciplinary facets of both design and type, which I wasn't 
accustomed to dealing with and bringing them in relation to each other. However, this was such an eye opener to me that I, during and after my PhD, I decided to take my professional roots in this direction instead of becoming a regular graphic and type designer. <clears throat> Yet another aspect of connecting the research lab with the educational program carries an essential component for a sustained research program. During the typographic courses at PXL Med School of Arts, the members of research are implementing scientific approaches into the curriculum. This means that undergraduate students get acquainted with their reading research during the typographic courses, theory as well as the practical courses. And they are exploring the role of the design researcher within the field of legibility and readability research in a conventional and an unconventional way with a lot of, I mean, uh, like that they can experiment and also see how these legibility insights can um, look for experimentation and innovation within graphic design. So graduate students like internal and external, external, they can also enroll as interns in the research lab research to experience and conduct legibility and readability research. And the created work of theory and practical experiments, they might have the potential to be further explored or embedded into ongoing research lines of research. And what we also see is that some of the interns and students, they grow uh, to become PhD students uh, within our own uh, lab. So here we are with the fourth and the uh, almost last point. Um, being part of an academic institute and uh, being an independent re uh, research lab herein, the value of research as one of the three main research labs uh, at our institute is valued by the university and university college school of arts. And therefore a continuity of internal and external funding is provided to make the research labs grow by means of uh, PhDs, postdoctoral researchers, research projects and projects assistance. Um, Next to uh, internal financing for reading research, we are also trying to find external financing in order to join forces on specific topics. An example that I give here is the collaboration that we have with Microsoft Advanced Reading Technologies in the US on visual prosody. And since 2015 and still ongoing, we are collaborating. This because on the one hand, these gifts are granted yearly and each time the results have been promising and an agreement for further uh, funding was settled. On the other hand, the research line of visual prosody hasn't been studied to this extent in the past. So this allows for a long time collaboration where each research lab leads into another one. Both Microsoft and research wish is to explore innovative ways to improve reading, both on paper and on screen. And our first studies related to beginner readers and the results proved to be a catalyst for first and other target groups like deaf and hard of hearing people, which in its turn resulted in new research questions. Second, for exploring other and new research approaches and methodologies to establish more profound evidence. Another source of finding external support is by means of governmental support. Currently, we see that we are uh, getting more successful in finding support for PhD students at the Research Foundation in Flanders that stimulates and financially supports fundamental scientific re research, strategic and basic research in Flanders. And next to that, we are also currently enrolling into a funding application together with the Industry Museum in order to innovate uh, design thinking by means of old crafts and typographic history. Furthermore, sustained support at research uh, is its membership within the Data Sciences Institute at Hasselt University. When the Data Sciences Institute was established, it was decided to involve specific research in the arts in the broad domain of, di of data science. And the main goal is to unite scientific data bound research and prepare society for a data driven future. The Data Sciences Institute strives for committed and innovative research and achieves this by focusing on both fundamental and applied research on all components of the data uh, science cycle. 
And in this cycle, uh, like applied arts cannot be uh, missed. Um, the search for sustaining collaborators has grown also from an engagement within the academic and or professional fields where common interests have been discovered between different and or the same fields of study through the networking. For example, like attending uh, conferences, uh, giving lectures, engaging with stakeholders, giving uh, workshops, getting involved in big research uh, setups like eReed Coast, and also having the opportunity to work interdisciplinary being a member of the Young Academy or setting up double diplomas with other universities, being involved in doctoral commissions and so on. So as a conclusion, uh, I do believe that academic typographic legibility research needs more variety in research topics, methodologies, and interdisciplinary approaches, and even collaborations in order to give the, the educational research program a stronger voice and guarantee the sustainability of new approaches as well. And the approaches herein can be very uh, diverse. In the past, the worlds of uh, a purely scientific field functioned mostly separate or disconnected from the field of typography and reading studies. However, joining the forces of those both worlds can be extremely useful for society and the typographic community because it can guarantee practical applications, both for the type and the typographic designers, because of more targeted guidelines for specific approaches. In that sense, it should also not be seen as a burden on creative skills, but rather the opposite. And also, for example, in products like, for example, educational setting, where these research results can serve as an evidence for type or typography adding to the learning process and or in the form of better reading uh, materials. So we need more correct studies to give the practice of typeface and typographic design a better scientific foundation in order to provide interesting data, which a typeface and typographic designer can accommodate more to the wishes of the reader, both impaired or not, and for a specific use, usage or different media, or in order to have a positive social impact and to contribute to a broader uh, context. Thank you for uh, listening and I'm happy to take uh, some questions. Thank you. Questions? Do you, or if there aren't any pressing ones, we can go on. I don't know who's going to moderate the questions, but Zainab will. Yeah, yeah. I have no questions, but with this very loud silence, I'm in, I'm impressed with it. I'm just trying to thank you trying to get it all in there. So thank you, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's go on. Uh, it, it, that we, we, we've allowed time for questions at the end. Um, so Renee, you wanna go ahead? Sure. Um, can everyone see my screen? Great. So my name is Renee Seward and I'm an endowed professor at the University of Cincinnati. I wear a couple of hats there though. I do teach typography. I'm a director of the Learning by Design Research Lab there. And I have co-founded a startup called Seward's Design. And today I wanna to talk about the uniting of applied research to uh, commercialization. Um, but before I go too far, I gotta start about how I fell into design research. And it really started with this care Character here. He uh, is one of the sons of my dearest friends and he has dyslexia. He came home and he was talking about why he kept failing the test and he kept attributing it to the way that the page was laid out. And so myself being a graphic designer, I wanted to help. And if I could make a page template, I was going to do it and give it to his school. So I began investigating the issues around it. And as I started this investigation, um, it le has led me on a sustained research journey, okay.
Renee, we lost audio here. It wouldn't be a virtual conference if this didn't happen at least once. Okay, Renee is back. Let's see if audio is working. Nope. Okay, so uh, let's, Renee, let's do this. Matt, if it's okay with you, uh, go uh, if you can go, and then Renee can sort out. Renee, typically quitting Zoom and coming back in should fix it. I like quit the whole app, and then let's see if it works. Okay, can you hear me? All right, I hit a button. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I hit a button. Um, I will try and pick up speed here. Um, can you see my screen? All right. Uh, so Caleb, he is the inspiration. Um, it's still not advancing. Um, Matt, do you want to go on and I'll come back to me? I'm having trouble advancing. Yeah, no problem. Okay. Can you guys see the screen? All right, here we go. Okay, um, well, hello everybody. My name is Matt Wazinski. Um, my title screen here is a warning that there are a lot of diagrams <laughs> in this presentation. Um, but uh, my um, presentation title is uh, Design as a Collaborator in Sustained Interdisciplinary Research and in particular in the humanities. And so um, I'm, um, diagramming sort of my various affiliations here, including uh, being an associate professor at the University of Cincinnati, uh, an associate editor for the journal Visible Language, um, new role as a PhD researcher at Carnegie Mellon University, and um, primarily speaking today about my role um, as design lead for um, an interdisciplinary research collaborative called History Moves. So um, I thought I would start before jumping into my own work and just share a kind of a framework that I have been kind of sketching around to help myself keep oriented when I'm doing um, interdisciplinary design research uh, or inter interdisciplinary research as a designer with other fields to help me kind of keep track of the fact that design as a as a, as a discipline, design as a, as a research field can take a lot of different models. Um, and I'm kind of sketching on this drawing by Herbert Beyer on kind of the immersiveness of a design experience. and. Um, trying to kind of map that, you know, we, we have concerns that may be uh, sort of formal and aesthetic and, and relate to humanistic models of research. We have concerns sometimes that are about materials and techniques, the way that we produce uh, images or symbols on, on surfaces or screens, which can take a kind of physical scientific approach to research. We have uh, issues or concerns related to perception and cognition, uh, which is maybe a different kind of uh, physical scientific uh, model of research. We have concerns sometimes about the context of interpretation and use of designed uh, artifacts or designed systems, which can uh, take a social scientific approach to a uh, research model. And then we have kind of the whole envelope studying how design um, is a part of or impacts different kinds of social, ecological, economic systems. And so these kinds of um, and these kinds of models of research are can be very different, you know, ranging from um, the humanistic to the physical scientific to the social scientific. And for me, it's been just useful to acknowledge these differences, even within uh, sustained research topics, that the the role design research can be playing may be very different, and that that difference may um, call on different kinds of methods that uh, we use to collect and generate different kinds of evidence, uh, which can lead to different kinds of results. And so it's a kind of big like roundabout way of saying that I think um, when we're talking about sustained research, or at least in my experiences in sustained research, it's it's useful to note that what role design is playing may shift across these different models in different phases of research or different phases of a project. And um, simply acknowledging that has been helpful for me to think about what kinds of things I might be participating in and doing and how that interfaces with the different uh, fields or researchers from different fields that I work with. And I think all of it also tells us that um, what comes out of the research may be useful in different directions. So, you know, what do we know? What do we learn from the research, the kind of content we generate? may not come back to design, but may be useful for a, a partner field. Um, how we know what the methods may sort of 
cross over from one discipline to another and the applications of what we do with that knowledge may also vary. And these I think all have implications for how we talk about uh, the generalizability, the repeatability, and in some ways the validity of research that we do. So um, again, kind of a roundabout way of getting to the point that in this sustained research uh, that I've been doing as part of this collaborative called History Moves, something I've been a part of for the last eight years, um, the, the model has shifted many times at different points in the research. I've been doing more sort of material and technical research and doing more kind of uh, context of interpretation and use and uh, other times looking at kind of the bigger picture, what role design is playing uh, socially, et cetera. So, History Moves, I would call it, I keep calling it a research collaborative. We've done several projects since 2014, which is kind of a long time. We've been working on a project called the Living Women's History of HIV in the United States. Um, in this work, we've, um, we've collaborated with over 40 women who are all HIV survivors from Brooklyn, Chicago, North Carolina. Um, we've done this in partnership with the Women's Interagency HIV Study which is a longitudinal study uh, started by Johns Hopkins in 1993. It's the longest running longitudinal uh, medical and social study of uh, women with HIV. We have collected hundreds and hundreds of audio excerpts from oral history interviews, hundreds and hundreds of images, personal images provided by participants, archival images collected by historical researchers that we've worked with around the country. And we've produced a wide range of public facing media, um, books, interactive uh, you know, sites and apps, short films, exhibitions, as well as lots of different forms of scholarship that feed into the different fields that are participating. And of course, I have to mention, we've been sponsored by organizations like Mac Cosmetics, uh, University of Illinois Chicago and the NEH. So back to my kind of diagramming, we're, we're, we're talking about a kind of um, research collaborative that brings together uh, methods of study from design generally, but participatory design in particular, from the humanities most generally, history more specifically, and public history more specific than that, um, as well as a, a kind of intersection in which we're uh, conducting a lot of methods that I think we can classify as being part of the digital humanities. Um, I also will say, I mean, it was great to watch Anne's presentation and sort of hear the kind of institutional structures that she's worked into it. Our, our collaborator is a little bit more rogue. It is really myself and my collaborator, Dr. Jennifer Breyer, who's a professor of uh, gender and women's studies as well as history at UIC, who operate this along with um, students and other researchers that we bring into specific projects. And so in the project, A Living Women's History of HIV in the United States, we're also engaged in a topic space, which is, uh, has in its broadest terms, uh, has to do with public health and more specifically has to do with uh, the topic of HIV and AIDS. And so uh, the point of, all, I think, all this diagramming is just to say that there are a lot of different uh, ways of knowing, a lot of different methods brought to, uh, to bear upon this kind of research, but there's also a lot of different kinds of knowledge that can be generated. And so um, in particular, I think it's been a kind of an interesting interplay between the methods of doing participatory design, of doing public history, that have produced new ways of knowing how to do this kind of work in the digital humanities and more broadly, um, even as sort of the, the content or the, the knowledge that has resulted from our study is particularly relevant uh, more to public history, the history of HIV and AIDS and public health more broadly. Um, but at the same time, um, doing this work and bringing in uh, expert design skills, I would say, related to UX, UI design, graphic design, and exhibition design has allowed the, the outputs and the applications of uh, the research to be really broadly distributed. So um, I have a lot of, I think, strong opinions about the, the relationship between participatory design as a model of design and expert design as a model. But suffice it to say, I think they both have really contributed in a way that the kinds of um, outputs that we're producing have a bearing on uh, all the different fields that we've touched. So just to give a kind of glance at some of the things we've done, this uh, similar to some of the conversations already had, this started in a really kind of exploratory, uncertain way. Um, we imagined that we were going to create a, a mobile humanities lab, like a bus that would actually travel around the city and sort of collect and synthesize and share stories about what was happening in, in different neighborhoods in, in Chicago and around the country. Um, we started in a very kind of like physical and material scientific kind of way, meaning trying to study what kinds of materials we could use for, you know, low cost interactive touch surfaces. And this really spun out a variety of different research projects that were focused on different aspects of this exploration. So uh, thinking about the way that we can use conductive inks to make legible circuits, to make paper become interactive with, you know, screens and audio kind of spun out into a side project for some graduate students. Um, using depth tracking cameras and projectors on stretched fabric surfaces 
spun out into its own kind of um, experimentation and exploration of uh, techniques that we could use to make soft uh, touch interactive surfaces. And eventually we discovered that, you know, buses are very expensive and maybe we didn't actually need to move the space around so much as we needed to move the tools and the methods around and began producing these mobile humanities toolkits that became the kind of the spine of the kind of hybrid methods that we developed for doing participatory public history. Um, there's been, uh, in short, a lot of different methods that we've experimented with and a lot of different methods that I think we've pulled from both uh, design, participatory design, as well as public history, but also methods that I think we've really, uh, I think interestingly evolved at that intersection, how to do uh, the collection of narratives, the collection of images, and that, in that interpretive work of images in ways that are broadly participatory with not just individuals sharing their stories, but individuals working together to tell and contextualize um, their, their, their stories and within a particular time and place. And so, um, of course, there's kind of an overarching um, process here, which goes from collection through interpretation, synthesis, designing, and then eventually displaying and discussing these, um, these outputs. Um, but we've attempted through this kind of merger of, um, of sort of disciplinary knowledge of methods to, um, to make this a participatory enterprise from start to finish. Uh, you can get a sense of some of the things that we've put together through a recent uh, collection of digital exhibitions we put out called Still Surviving. You can find it at stillsurviving.net. We've collected uh, and put together a collection of visual histories, um, an audio um, interface to listen to hundreds of clips of uh, the women describing their own experiences in their own words. We're also putting together a book collection um, that will be available in print on demand as well as uh, multimedia forms. Um, but again, this is, I think, the, the ways in which expert design uh, knowledge can come to bear on, uh, on putting this project out into the world in ways that can be interpreted outside the academic context of their uh, study. So um, I guess somewhat in summary, you know, this, this, these questions of, you know, how, what do we know? What is sort of the content or the results of the research? How do we know it? What methods do we use? And then what do we do with it? The kinds of applications have really, the, the results of these things have pointed in some different directions. The, the content, the results of the research are pr primarily relevant to the history of HIV and AIDS in this country. Um, the methods have brought together uh, kind of, um, uh, some some hybrids around participatory design and public history, while the applications I think uh, demonstrate some relevance and, um, and and can contribute to how we understand the roles of design, public history, digital humanities, public health, and more specifically how those things bear on uh, the issue of HIV and AIDS as it continues into the 21st century. Um, and I think just to to notice, I mean, one of the outcomes of doing a sustained um, practice of research around a specific topic like this is that I do think a certain kind of transdisciplinary knowledge has evolved, um, which has to do with how we can understand histories of HIV AIDS through design. Um, I think this was kind of interestingly, I guess, validated, I could say, by the fact that my collaborator and I have um, were asked a few years ago to contribute to a book that's cataloging the largest collection of uh, posters and public health communications relating to HIV AIDS collected from around the world, um, over 8,000 pieces of public health communications. We were asked to write the lead essay, which it you know, sees a graphic designer and a historian of HIV AIDS uh, reading this history through public health communications, through the history of design and through the, the history of this epidemic. Um, in a book that includes contributors like Dr. Anthony Fauci, who is not so squarely in the spotlight when we wrote the essay, but has come into it again uh, in light of COVID, as well as um, sort of activist designers and artists, including Abram Finkelstein, uh, founder of Grand Fury and ACT UP. So uh, this is just a sort of skim of how I think that um, sustained research in a topic, uh, particularly in the humanities, has been um, sort of interestingly benefited from uh, design as a collaborator. And you can check out uh, more of that again at stillsurviving.net. Thank you, Matt. Matt, I, I, have a, I have a question that it may not be related directly, but how has the pandemic mix with your research, seeing that you've been researching AIDS, which is not necessarily a pandemic in, in the same way, but you, you, you're you one of the experts into looking at a sickness as it affects a community. The, the pandemic, did it, did it offer new insights on how you're conducting research? Did it allow you to make assumptions at a particular way ahead of, I mean, I, 
I don't have the articulation completely, but I could see somebody like you who have been researching this particular topic suddenly thrown into the, you know, the whole world is thrown into your area now. And you're one of the people that I would love to see how, how, how will your research then come to play now? Yeah, it's a great question. And of course, yeah, um, the whole unfolding of COVID has looked different to me, I think, having having studied this. And I mean, I, I should say, I guess, um, as, a, as a note of positionality, I guess, I mean, as a straight white man in the US, the topic of HIV AIDS, even though it sort of parallels my entire lifetime, has not been a central feature of my life. And so it was quite um, you know, it's, it's quite eye-opening to do this research and uh, it took a lot of, I would say, trust uh, building up to, to go into the clinics and do this work. Um, but I, I think that what we've, un, what, we've, what we've begun to discover is that the, a question that the research did not set out to ask, but now I think responds to in a way by what we're producing is, you know, what does it mean not only to survive an epidemic or a pandemic, but what does it mean to survive public concern over it? So, you know, that these women, some of whom have been living with HIV for, you know, nearly 40 years, um, everyone cares about COVID right now because it's, it's, it's an important issue, but 20, 40 years from now, we will have people who are COVID survivors and the world may have moved on in some way. And uh, certainly a lot of the I would say structural issues related to health, healthcare, health access, or limits, limitations. <laughs> I have my visitor here. Um, limitations to it um, are are very, very familiar from the study of HIV to to looking at what's happening with COVID uh, right now. So it's a very small and sort of impartial um, response to your question, but I think in particular studying the way that public health communications are handled um, and looking at it through, you know, in in hindsight at HIV/AIDS. Uh, makes me worry that uh, there's a, there's, there tends to be a kind of a singular top-down approach to communications that maybe aren't reaching communities appropriately around these issues. And I think we can, we can see that in a variety of ways, uh, even in this country, in the way, um, you know, responses to COVID have been, you know, not only politicized and stigmatized, but that the communications themselves may be getting muddied in the process. Yeah, that's, excuse me for jumping in, but I think that's one of the things that intrigues me most about Matt's work is he's really been exploring how people that are stigmatized respond uh, long term. What, what you know, how does that impact you as a person? And, and we have people stigmatized at all ends of even of the political spectrum for, for wearing masks, for not wearing masks, for being vaccinated, for not being vaccinated. So it's just interesting that the relationship of stigma being stigmatized to public health issues is very interesting. Renee? Yes, I'm ready. You good? Yeah, I understand what happened now. So, <laughs> um, so moving past Caleb as being my inspiration, getting into how I got into sustained research before I went to further besides feeling the frustration of Caleb, I needed to stop and move past my assumptions, my thought, and recognize that this community I'm not a part of. I struggled to read uh, as a young person, but I don't suffer with dyslexia. So I needed to take a pause and do some research on what it really was. And in that research, the book research, I found a study in 1975 that dispelled a myth about what dyslexia was, that it wasn't a visual perception problem. And it outlined four key reading related tasks that are at the heart of someone struggling to read. Um, with this, I realized that I could probably take on uh, looking at designing for three out of the four of these. But book research is not enough, you know, in terms of a method of getting into an approach. I had to surround myself with others who know um, about education uh, on a much more deeper level. And I have to give a large shout out to a private school in North Carolina called Fletcher Academy that specialized in teaching ADHD and dyslexic children who invited me in, let me observe, gave me feedback on the things that I was making. Um, moving forward a little bit past the research that I developed at North Carolina State as my thesis, I came to the University of Cincinnati and quickly surrounded myself with collaborative partners from other disciplines in order to move forward on this. Um, we decided to take on number two, 
um, of this study that we found in 1975. And the research questions that I was asking at the time um, had a lot to do with how do you map images to letter forms. Um, originally in graduate school, it was focused on dyslexic children 9 to 11, but in pivoting towards the University of Cincinnati, we focus on struggling readers. Um, and the, at least this initial one was pre-K to at-risk first grade. Um, the heart of what we were developing centered around these typographic forms here that had images built in them. So you could click on them or trace them and it exposes images that will cue you to the sound involved. For example, magnet, magnifying glass, milk, the common sound is mm, versus pea, peach, pea pod, pie, the common sound is so we took this strategy and with my graduate student, I'm falling into this idea of sustained research, we began making. And for a year and a half, we visualized the 44 sounds to the English language um, with the goal of creating a prototype here um, that then could be used on pre-K to at-risk first graders. Uh, we took this prototype with our collaborators and began doing other types of research, um, participatory methods with the educational um, psychologists, with the literary and classroom teachers, all working together with the students. There was many months of making things, seeing it break, not work right, uh, come back together and collaboratively rapid prototype this out. So we got to a much more stable type of prototype between the students and the teachers and myself and my design team. So important that this tool fit like a glove for who we were designing for. But once we got the tool more stable, we were able to take it and begin doing an efficacy study. So it's not that we just made it, it needed to show proof that it had effectiveness. So we did, we ran efficacy studies in inner city schools here inside of Cincinnati. And um, while small ends in relationship to a lot of the efficacy studies around reading that happened in other disciplines, happy to see the outcomes and particularly around spelling, where at the top there on the right, we had a large gap between the testing group and the control. And at the end, we all but closed the gap. Um, so we had a lot of partners that allowed us to come in um, and were resources to us as we were building this tool that I was hoping would impact inside of education. And at the end of it, we did have a product that had personalized learning, multi-sensory learning, but even more so than that, it could claim evidence-based results. So we knew that it, it had effects there. And it had a teacher side that allowed the teacher to set custom lesson plans and track students. Um, while we were doing design research, it came a point where we began doing marketing research as well understanding who are the users and what would the market of this be like. So pivoting a little bit into business to understand, um, is this some type of a tool that could be commercialized so that it could get into the hands of the people who need it the most? Um, from that research, there were ultimately two products that were developed, C-Word School and C-Word Home, as we realized that it's not just about the teacher and the students. The parents play a huge role, and there's like this triangular effect of wanting to bridge school to home. Um, had a large collaborative team and so many undergraduate and graduate students along the way helping with this project. But at the end of the day, we formed a startup company with these products. Um, not because I'm into commercialization or wanted to start my own company, because I wanted to get the hands, the tool in the hands of the people that needed the most. I'm so proud of the accomplishment that the tool received. It received the best product of the year in 2019, as well as we were featured in Forbes for the starting up of this company and the impact inside the community. All of that journey was fuzzy. I know what I was doing, but stepping away from it and learning lessons from it, I realized that there's this part that is a research lab that we were working on years prior to that. And so we formed this research now to continue to ask hypothetical questions about how um, we can impact inside of reading um, in hopes that the things that we create could push out into the startup company for commercialization. 
inside of the lab currently um, from insights of that first product, we developed this uh, variable font that just recently won an STA 100 award. Um, it now is a typable font inside of the apps that we created. It was all hard coded. It works similar to the app in that this typable font, um, when you have it and you're reading on screen, you can roll over it and receive those visual cues that cues you into knowing what sound belongs with the letter form there. Um, so bringing more technology inside of it. And we've now built a whole database for 44 sounds of the English language, which we're currently revising inside of the lab. Um, we have a second typeface in development inside of the lab that visualizes orthographic rules. So if you're reading on screen, don't know the letter sound, it will stretch long so that it's the letter A. And when you're done, you can put it away. They're kind of hidden drawers there for you to access when you need to. If a letter is silent, it goes back because it's something that isn't said. So trying to make visual evident the rules of reading, but also make it so that people who are struggling to read have access to strengthen their reading without everybody knowing their business. So we took this technology and we embedded it inside of a web browser extension. Now, if you're a grown person struggling to read, you wanna read CNN or ESPN, simply go to the website of interest to you find an article, then click our web browser extension, which will re-render the text of that article in one of our fonts. Now, anytime you're struggling to decode a word, simply roll over the letters and receive a visual or auditory clue on how it pronounces itself. It's your business if you're struggling with this. And as you span out to third grade plus, there is a stigma to um, not being able to read that we're trying to move past. Um, we've been lucky enough in the time of COVID to test this on a very small audience of high schoolers who were at the sixth and seventh grade level. And after a seven week period, we got those uh, high schoolers to uh, somewhere between an eight and 10th grade reading from using this tool. So very promising. We're hoping to do a larger study as we move forward on the effects of it. Um, and we're excited to bring in other types of technology with these fonts. How does AR and VR play a role? Can we have these things and the students in the classroom physically be able to touch and bounce and move on them? Or can we use AR to rescript what reading glasses are? It's not just about legibility, but it's about decoding the words that you make that fixation. So um, the heart of this is really asking these questions, collaborating with the other disciplines and coming out with uh, studies that prove its results and hopefully headed towards commercialization. A lot of people often ask me, where's Caleb? Because he was my inspiration. You might remember this story from 2019. That's Caleb there. He was a part of the Morehouse class that the billionaire paid off his school. So now Caleb's headed to law school. So um, my, my journey in falling into this started with Caleb, but now I understand the connection between this applied research and trying to ultimately get it into the hands of the people that need it most. Thank you. Thank you, Renee. That was amazing. <laughs> Any Thank questions you. for Renee? Just a question in the chat. Okay, Renee, what types, if any difficulties have you or your collaborators had to deal with uh, reworking with school personnel and admin? Um, it was hard getting into the schools. You walk in as a designer and say you want to teach reading <laughs> and they'll send you out really quick. Uh, so figuring out who were the educators that I could like hop on their back and say, can you get me in there? And I found one and she was trusted in the community and whatever she said, people said, and she said, give her a shot. And they gave me a shot. And I'm thankful that I could find that person to just say, give her a shot. <laughs> Renee, thanks for that answer. I'm, I'm somebody who did research on uh, using design. Uh, it was actually my graduate thesis not quite 30 years ago when I was at Michigan. And uh, it took me about six months to get permission to get into schools in South Texas. Um, and uh, I, I'm, I'm really intrigued by what you've done. My hat's off to you and your colleagues for doing it. Uh, another question I have, and it's something we're, we're dealing with here, but I think a lot of designers are, uh, you kind of breezed over it to get to other 
uh, that sounds like a knock and it's not, I'm sorry. Um, but, but when you got to wherever you are now, Cincinnati, I think, um, getting other uh, professors or uh, people across campus uh, to work with you, how did you make your initial entreaty to them? How, how did you reach out to them? How did you get them um, excited about what you were doing? I mean, how did that collaborative research relationship get off the ground? I just was hoping that you could share that because I think it's something that, I mean, I, I've been in design research now for a little over a quarter of a century, and it is one of the tougher nuts to crack sometimes uh, yeah. at universities is, is getting other folks to realize we're, we're not here to make and no knock on Matthew, I'm sorry. We're not here just to make your diagrams look cool. We 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 know how to do a whole lot more than than that. Yeah, yeah. Um, really, networking was a lot of it. Um, they, I just went and had coffee with people and showed them what I'm doing, and I said, "You want to help me?" And it's more of coming in from the idea of you want to help. I am not the person that's going to test the efficacy study. They know all about it. I'm not the person that is making sure that this is grounded in the educational research. It's us partnering in methods to help make that go. And so when they really understood, like, we're here to work together. But I have to tell you, it's a long time for us all to get on the same page. And a lot of looking at each other like, are we on the same team? Are we headed in the same direction? But, you know, just recently, the people I'm collaborating with now, it took a year for us to really understand how to be frank and how to move this thing forward. So it takes time, networking, and discussions about how do we have the same vocabulary? I think Mike talks a lot to me about it, the shared vocabulary between us and the discipline, but then us and other disciplines. That's a huge thing. Um, just getting to, we work a lot with our social scientists here, but um, just again, throwing this out to everybody, that it, it you got to put the work in to get to those common understandings uh, or or you know, that it's it's really a crucial thing for us to do. And we're designers, we're supposed to be able to do it well, but we've got to be able to make a case for ourselves. And it sounds like you've done that to good effect. I, I just want to chime in and uh, Renee mentioned efficacy studies and so forth and my collaborating across disciplines. Uh, they pretty quickly ask, where's the beef? You know, where's the evidence? Where's the evidence that this really makes a difference? And you, you see, Renee's been careful to show that at every step. So I, I found that to be, especially with more mature disciplines like education or medicine, it, you, if you can't produce the evidence, they're just not going to be very interested in collaborating with you. So, uh, and Renee, Renee said she may not do the efficacy studies herself, or, or may, you know, she may not do them alone, but yeah, you got to have some evidence. Uh, let's say you have two questions uh, for all the panelists, right? Sure, I can. <laughs> I could ask those. Uh, yeah, that was the hope. Let me roll back. So um, I don't personally have access to graduate students in my current role. So I just wanted to ask all three panelists and anybody else who wants to talk about it. What are your thoughts about involving undergraduate design students in your research? Yes. I think they're a big, they're a big part of it. And I, I think what I've been seeing is I love the connection of the undergraduate to the graduate student. And then when they're of different professions and how you throw them all together to begin working on this stuff, um, it's 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 been fun to watch. I think that they, there's much value into them understanding design research on an undergraduate level. I, I completely agree. Also, currently at our uh, School of Arts, I'm also trying to push uh, for getting undergraduate students to be within a system in which they can collaborate within uh, legibility research so that they are already aware and that they are, you know, curious about what they can do. Because it was only back, I think, in 2005 or 2006 when uh, one of the main legibility research uh, Kevin Larson gave um, a presentation in ATAPI that he was in the beginning, now he's very popular, but in the beginning they didn't like him because uh, designers, they had the idea that if somebody is going to tell them what to do to improve legibility, that it would be a burden on their creativity, but it's rather the opposite. Uh, and that's also what I'm trying to do within my um, my assignments for, for the undergraduate uh, students is to give them 
specific kind of legibility insights, but let them go completely crazy by means of it, you know, that they can experiment, that they can go, you know, beyond the borders of what convention describes. So that, you know, that they, that they can look for that innovation that we still need within legibility research. Um, yeah, so, so, so yes, I, I completely also agree with, with Renee. Like I would be completely open and also to see how, how it's possible with uh, other universities or uh, art schools to see how we can work on, on a project like collaboratively you know, by mixing, maybe mixing teams, you know, like students from several countries. And it's like, it could be like a team assignment. So, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll agree, but maybe in a slightly different way with uh, some of the work that I shared, um, certainly bring undergraduates into it. We have, I think your other question is wrong here, some IRB uh, challenges sometimes with, so I, I might not bring in undergraduate students directly into um, doing the research, but but in, in our case, making use of some of the results, like we've, we've generated and collected certain amounts of content and um, letting undergraduate students work with that material and, and sort of challenging them to think about how to make, make legible, make usable, make comprehensible to young people, uh, history of HIV and AIDS uh, in the United States. And so that can be, I think a valuable tool to bring to the classroom for you know engaging that kind of work, um, in, encouraging the students to do their own research based around that topic in their own ways, uh, but also becomes um, at least inspirational for our own our own project and what we might do with it. Hey Renee, can I? Uh, I I'm always putting Renee on the spot. She's one of my favorite people. But could, could you could you just briefly this IRB issue? Because I don't maybe a lot of people aren't familiar with it. What what does your IRB look like now? Did you didn't you develop kind of a, a kind of a global IRB protocol that you could put a lot of your research under? Remind me of that. Um, we're constantly writing IRBs. Um, but the one that we have active right now tried to write it a little bit flexible for the fact you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> you might need to pivot at some point. Um, so writing it large enough for um, the number of participants, the different types of participants you might encounter that you need to pivot towards. But no, not broadly for all of it. Um, definitely have like three, four different protocols I've put in over time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the reason I asked is because of my, my ongoing research. At one point, I sought the help of the, one of the RARB experts to write a protocol that I could put a lot of my studies under. So I wouldn't, every time I wanted to do a new survey, have to write a new IRB protocol. So I had them help me write a broad one that I could put 10 or 15 studies, uh, individual studies under. So, and, and Renee's done some of that, I know, but yeah. Yeah, 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 mm -hmm. that is true. We, yeah. it's, it's interesting for, for me, for our, the uh, History Moves project, um, when we started this at the University of Illinois at Chicago, because it started as an oral history project, oral history is not considered generalizable research um, by IRB. So we were you know, outside the parameters of IRB, and yet we're working with what IRB would consider vulnerable populations in terms of uh, people wanting to maintain anonymity and the issues of stigma and its medical condition, et cetera. So we actually, like, you know, in, in some ways outside of IRB have had to come up with our own sort of um, kind of ongoing processes of consent for both the collection and distribution of material and that, that changes over time. But then once I bring, you know, like a graduate student or somebody else into the project to interface with the work uh, or interface with the participants directly, then we do IRBs for that, that piece of the study. I saw Michael's comment there. Uh, I was a director of our graduate program for a while. And uh, while, while I was director, we required in the first week of their graduate studies, we required every graduate student to get IRB training and be IRB certified. So it's that's become a part of life, at least at you at least as Matt says, you at least have to know how to navigate the IRB system. If you want an exemption, you at least have to know how to apply for that. And uh, I, I think pretty much all universities have an IRB office. Uh, if certainly if they get any government funding, I think they have to have an IRB office. I think yeah, we 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 found um, and thanks very much, Mike, for offering that. Uh, we recently, well, over the course of about seven years, did a canvas of a variety of design programs across North America. And one of the things that um, alarmed us, and this is getting into other territory, was uh, how few uh, design students in graduate school 
got exposed to what Mike just talked about. And that's that, you know, wherever you do it. So we, we did it as part of, uh, you know, our thesis process here is a two semester um, uh, experience. And, but we did exactly what Mike's talking about. We hit the ground running uh, the first few weeks of that first semester thesis experience and getting students familiar with not just this is an IRB, this is why they exist, which somebody else pointed out, I think Lisa did in the chat. Uh, you know, if you're, it's, if you're doing human subjects research, which is so much of what we do, you have to understand that, know about it. Here's how you execute one, here's how you get it approved. But uh, yeah, if you're in a, any kind of institution that receives public funding, so if you're in a state university, I am, uh, you have to have a research office that, that can help facilitate um, getting IRBs uh, approved and, and done. I, but my concern, uh, and that, I, I don't mean to belabor this, uh, is that not enough uh, design students at graduate level get exposed, you know, even if it's only for a few weeks, heck, even if it's just a few workshops, we're seeing that, that uh, and we've seen a lot of this as, as we've worked on dialectic, we're not seeing enough graduate students in design who learn about the IRB process, um, in, in, even if they don't get immersed in it. Uh, IRB are still unfamiliar initials to too many. Well, Matt, do you want to uh, you want to just dive in? Maybe I can verbally. Uh, I don't want to cut off questions uh, at, at any point, uh, but you want to dive into the to the Moreau sure. board yes. and and, uh, and we talk about the survey results. Yeah. So Mike and I worked together on putting together um, the Moreau board, which the link is there in the chat. And so if everybody anybody's interested, want to pop over there. Um, the survey was, there was a survey that was earlier, sur survey that was uh, circulated earlier um, that had some, some questions uh, related to, um, to Mike's earlier points at the beginning of this, um, this panel about, you know, what, what do we as design educators, designers, design researchers think are the kind of, you know, thick topics uh, relevant to communication design research that, that warrants and could, could, could use um, sustained research of the kinds of the various kinds that I think were described today, and so we put together this board um, uh, in part to collect uh, even more sort of in-depth thoughts about that. So, based on kind of early results of the survey, um, have put together um, some of the kind of the results of, of of the topics that were floated in the survey. Um, so, if you look at the top there on the sustained research subjects board. Um, in green, we have some of the ones that were floated. And again, Mike pulled these out from things that we've seen in visible language as topics that are, that are recurring lately. Um, and uh, based on the 30 or so respondents already, we've seen how people have, have voted on those. But going even deeper than, than the topics, I think, um, you know, if you're a sustained research subject needs a lot of different kinds of questions to be asked. So what kinds of questions people might have about those, we can use the yellow post-its below that. Um, what kinds of contexts, so context of use or context of, of application of that, of that research or that knowledge or the different contexts of studying it, we think should be addressed within a research topic. And then what kinds of practices, what, what design practices would be involved with, informed by, or impacted by um, uh, this kind of research. So that's, that's kind of the gist of, of what's happening on the left of that middle panel titled Sustained Research Subject. To the right, we've I've written a few already of uh, some, some free responses that people included in the survey of what they think are topics that, that uh, are, warrant some sustained research. There's some more open posted therapy of other ideas. Um, but we're, we're gonna keep this open for at least the next 10 days. And so we don't need to fully workshop this whole thing now, but wanted to put this out there as uh, both our kind of mechanism for collecting, but also wanting to discuss um, what we think warrants sustained research. And it all ties together to, um, if you see at the bottom there, uh, another point Mike made earlier, which is about uh, this call for papers um, uh, that uh, Mike has assembled for a special edition of Visible Language, looking for reports on sustained research that has been done. So kind of work that Renee and, and Anna have been doing, for example, or for uh, a, um, an informed uh, paper on recommending what sustained research topics are warranted and why, I mean, providing some evidence of why that sustained research would be would be worth sustained research and what it what would it be um, predicated upon. 
So I'll open this up, you know, we've kind of opening this up for people to, um, to work on at their, at their leisure, but also open to, you know, further discussions. If anybody has some topics that they want to throw out there and for us to discuss, that would also be great. I so appreciate being able to be, uh, I, I hope the present, I, I was inspired by Anne, Renee, and Matt's presentations. I hope you all were too. I, it's great to see what, what sustained research looks like from their perspectives. And I tried to get a variety of perspectives and I'm sure there are others, but, but whatever. But um, I, I, I just, I, I really wanna solicit this community. And as you network other communities, I, I think it's really is important to get some community consensus around the importance that sustained research is important. That's something we should be striving for. It, frankly, I, I didn't, I don't want to talk too much, but I sustained research is one of the most funs I ever fun things I did as a design uh, educator, a practitioner. The, it's like, yeah, it's like when you were a practice, when I was a practicing designer, gee, the self-defined projects were always the most fun, right? Oh, wow. I get to do what I want instead of just always what the client wants. But research is just that. It's just like, wow, I got this interest and I get to focus on it for months or years. It's, it's really one of the most fun things. But, but it, I really want to salute this community and other related communities of, uh, of design support for promoting design, design research at a high level like Matt, Renee, and Ann are doing and encouraging sustained programs and encouraging staying, sustained programs around what the community community thinks are really important things to be that, that need to be learned. We need, you know, for example, I would say, if you're gonna build a house, you have to have a foundation. The foundation needs to be made out of certain materials. And I think before we can advance our discipline, we need sustained research on some of those key foundational things. Otherwise we'll be building our research on, you know, thin air. And, and I think, uh, Matt, Ann, and Renee are each clearly tapped into some, some pretty basic things. The importance of typography and how we express ourselves. That, that's, uh, what did you say, Renee, uh, Matt, uh, Matt, the other day that um, the, uh, Luke Woods at Facebook said, uh, you know, if a designer can't do typography, they're not much use to him. <laughs> so, so you know he said typography is like essential if you can't do typography i can teach people how to design the facebook way but if i i don't have time to teach them how to do typography anyway so so there are these and anyway, i'm sorry for rambling but but that this this exercise this moreau board i i think if i it wasn't just to be entertaining it was from my way of trying to say i think this is important and it should come from the community I don't know who else it would come from, you know, but the AIGA, I mean, they're, they're a little too dispersed to come up with the key tasks, although maybe a professional organization should provide that role. Anyway, so, so please partic participate in the board. Um, I don't know if you've updated it, Matt, but the survey, thank you for responding to the survey, and it had 33 participants last I saw, and right now, um, 58% of you say that you're doing uh, research, but 41% uh, have been doing some kind of sustained research on a specific topic. So there's clearly room to improve in terms of sustained. Any, so any, really any questions, any comments, any, I'm sorry for editorializing. I think there's no need to be sorry for your editorializing, Mike. I, I thank you very much for articulating what you just did. Um, I guess one of the things that, uh, in, in terms of, again, as somebody who's been engaged in, I, I've had to do a lot of explaining in, in my career about what happens when you put the words design and research together. Uh, I was the first person at my great big public tier one research university in Texas to do that. Um, and I had a real hard time getting people to, to listen to what I was talking about. And then I landed my first major grant and then I got another one uh, and I wouldn't have gotten them. And it's why I was asking uh, Renee the question about how you uh, got relationships with collaborators, those grants, I, I didn't do them by myself. 
Uh, and I think that's one of the really important things to understand about research and what we can bring to the table as designers is because of the different kinds of sensibilities and skills and bases of knowledge that we draw from to do our work, we actually become, can become really effective kind of, I don't know what to, what word to use, um, loci, nexuses, uh, if that's even the plural of nexus, uh, for different kinds of people to come together. Um, we can help bring different kinds of people, different ideas together. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm so interested, Brene, it's, it's personal. Uh, I've been looking at the effects of all the different kinds of learning experiences that fall under the dyslexia umbrella. I mean, I started that research when I was an undergraduate in Kansas City uh, with the, the big support of Victor Papanek, which I guess ages me, um, which is fine. Um, but it's, it's uh, and it, it's, I, I think, um, so I'm, I'm really encouraged and heartened to hear and see, uh, and I'm trying not to get too emotional here, uh, what you guys are doing. I, I think there's not enough of it. It's why journals like Visible Language and Dialectic and Design Issues and Design Studies and the, the International Journal of Design Research, it's why they exist. Um, you know, and, and I think we just, we're on the cusp of something where we're, we're getting to the point where I was told, you know, 26 years ago when I first started teaching that, you know, your generation is going to be the one that, that starts to get this off the ground. And now I'm looking out at these things and I'm seeing people who are, um, you know, younger than I am who are doing this. And that's so encouraging and inspiring. And, and uh, um, it, it fills me, I'll, I'll just be frank. I mean, it makes me joyful. It makes me happy to see this kind of thing happening. So uh, yeah, design research. I mean, we're trying to affect positive change. I mean, we use that acronym, social, technological, economic, environmental, political, values-based, ethical. Uh, there's so many different umbrellas that we can get under. There's so many different groups that we can participate uh, in and with in our communities and in our universities. And I need to stop talking now. So um, anyway, I just, I just want to encourage this. I want to uh, encourage all of you who are getting into research, who are doing it, to report out. Uh, you've got Mike here uh, and Matt from Visible Language. You've got me here from Dialectic. Uh, the more that we get uh, the word out uh, effectively about what we do, I think the more opportunities we create for ourselves and our colleagues. Hey, uh, hey, hey, Matt. Um, all right because you've just been done the search about PhD programs on the discussion board there, there's a, sorry, Michael, not to jump, but the uh, uh, question about PhD programs that are doing research. You've just looked into that uh, recently. Can you, uh, or yeah. Anne or uh, Renee, but can you comment on that? Well, I mean, the short, the short answer is it's, it's quite limited in the United States. And it's, I, I would perceive that as kind of a cart horse issue. You know, we don't have enough people with PhDs in design teaching, so we don't have enough people getting PhDs in design. So um, there are um, programs, uh, PhD design programs, uh, I believe at North Carolina State University, Arizona State University. Uh, there are two at Carnegie Mellon that are quite different. One's attached to the HCI unit and one's um, uh, what they call transition design. Um, I think there are a couple more that I'm probably missing, but I would also say that, I mean, of those four I just named, they're all quite different also. I mean, their, their approaches to, um, to design, design research and sort of the issues that design contends with are, are different. Um, it is, as probably some people know, I mean, it is becoming the case in other parts of the world that a PhD is required even to teach in a university, to teach design. This is the case primarily in Australia now, and increasingly the case in the UK and parts of Europe. So, um, in some ways, it feels like the writing's on the wall. I mean, we're, we, we have a maturing uh, research discipline uh, in design, and so uh, we, we could benefit from more people doing PhD studies, and I think this will continue to increase the bar of research done in, in all of the different directions that design uh, conducts research. So I hope that answers. And I, I see in the chat someone asking, do you need a PhD to do this type of research? I don't have a PhD right now. Um, and I, I understand that our discipline is growing up and probably the last generation that will be teaching as I am without it. But um, I think that it is possible, but I, I do see a lot of strengths in having the PhD. 
Yeah, but you know, Renee obviously has PhD level, level skills and experience and way beyond that. She's developed them. She didn't get them in, well, she did get them in school at her, at her master's program, but she's developed them. So she's clearly qualified. And uh, also the, on the PhD thing, how, what's the situation like in Europe? How many PhD programs, there are a lot more programs in Europe for PhD in design, are there not? Yes, I think here that um, almost like every uh, university here in Belgium that is connected to an, an, an art department uh, is offering um, PhD positions. Um, and also what I said in my presentation, it's only since 1999 that it's ongoing that, you know, that we as an academic community or as a design community are now linked to universities because before that wasn't the case and that made it possible of, you know, um, how, how Gerard Unger expressed it quite nicely and, and in order to show and prove how, for example, typography can be a vehicle for uh, science uh, and, and why it's important also to get your hands on, on that topic as well. Um, but, but here in Belgium, yes, there are a lot of, of possibilities of, of trying to start with a PhD. But for example, at, at my university, you need to find a way in the existing research groups because they see it as a kind of an added value to extend upon. For example, I, I also have some kind of applicant, ap applicants that, that are interested in doing a, a PhD uh, research, but then it's for example, uh, focusing on specific kind of historical aspects within typography or within type. So I redirect them to uh, the university in Reading because they are more specialized in that. So I'm, I'm focusing on, on legibility uh, issues and legibility matter. And I think that every university more or less has, has set out the specific kind of research lines. And I think that's needed also because we are talking about sustained programs. And in, in that sense, one research leads to another one. And it's definitely the case that we don't need PhDs, but researchers. But yeah, the PhD leads to the education of design research, which is quite new in my eyes. Uh, and also how we deal with design research and try to get students on board. Uh, so it's it's a very good shift that that was here in, in, in Europe that PhDs became possible. And there is still, I, I think, a long way to go. Um, but yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and Carol in the chat there has made the great point. Um, that, that, you know, we don't necessarily need more PhDs. We need more good design researchers. And those aren't necessarily the same thing. And, and yeah, I'm not a big fan of uh, philosophy and design. <laughs> I'm a little more excited about actual do, actually doing good research and coming up with some results in design. So anyway, thank Carol for that. And it, yeah, and, and I'll, only, I'll only add to, I think Anne's point was a good one too, though. I mean, I 100% I, I agree. On the other hand, sustained research in design in a university would benefit from PhD programs in which students can iterate on their research. Um, you know, we've probably all experienced working with undergrad or graduate students as research assistants for maybe a semester, right? And so you kind of lose that ability for sustained uh, commitment to a topic, which is quite different. I, I loved in Anne's presentation how she talked about, you know, how many I think decades of research has been happening in other disciplines about typography and legibility factors, and we have not been a part of the discussion. You know, I felt like we've been using scissors and glue over here while they've been testing what we've been making. And while I will always use my scissors and glue, I also want to pick up the tools to begin to test what it is that I'm making. Yeah, yeah, well said. Maybe I, I have one question because what, what we see here, for example, in Belgium and I think also in the Netherlands is that there is now kind of a deviation between different kinds of art departments where we talk about academic art departments and professional um, mm -hmm. art mm -hmm. departments. And in, in that sense, we do see that with the academic art departments that we have more of students who are interested into diving into 
design research and to elaborate on specific kind of thoughts that they might have. While in the professional art departments, you know, they are more working, which is totally okay uh, as well, but in, in which they are more working towards uh, being um, um, or having a job in a, in, in a design studio um, and, and only, you know, do design work in, in instead of the design thinking. And I, I think that in the last years, we do see quite a difference also in the output um, that, uh, that is created. But that's the same in the US or, or not, yeah. I, I think that is happening to a degree here. The other area where we're finding, uh, at least in, in, our, in, in Austin and in Dallas Fort Worth, but I'm seeing this in other parts of the country and I think around the world, um, UX and IX, uh, user experience. And there's such an enormous um, human-centered, for, for lack of better terminology right now, uh, aspect to getting into UX and IX. So they're starting, that's starting to be a place where the, to, to your point, and some of the, the professional focus is blending with more of the uh, uh, academic and the research-based. And I, I think it's, it's going to be really interesting to see where that goes. If you sort of look at what's some of the things that have happened in the Design Research Society and IXDA uh, of late, you're starting to, I'm doing this with my fingers, you're starting to see more uh, of that kind of interlacing starting to happen and affect uh, the thinking uh, and, and, and blending in those areas. I'm excited to, to see that intersection, not the separation of the two, but the intersection between the two worlds. Um, at the University of Cincinnati, we have a co-op, you know, it's big professional, they go out and work. And I think during the time of this pandemic, when the market has been slow, we've introduced EEPs as an option for students so they can enter into the research labs and continue to do it. And I've been excited to hear the feedback from the students of having a different experience of the, the professional world to the research labs and how they felt like it was refreshing. And so seeing this next generation takes both of them and what will happen in both areas of academia as well as the professional industry, I'm excited to see what happens there. All right, so I hate to cut it off, but I think on that note, we might need to. So if we could all please one more final round of applause for our fantastic panelists. Thank you so much. And Mike Zender, thank you for organizing this, helping to facilitate it. Thank you so much, Zainab, for being here and being such a fantastic moderator. She was on fire with the links in the chat. So everyone, please go take a quick break, but come back and join us for our next session, which is happening in an hour and a half. It's called, So You Want to Write a Book? Robin Landa has a whole bunch of amazing panelists who are going to talk about their experiences. So come back in an hour and a half and we will see you it's all. It's happening in 30 time. minutes. Sorry, Lisa, oh, it's in no, 30 minutes. I lied. It's in 30 minutes. Ooh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Thank you, Alberto. <laughs> 30 minutes only. Come back. <laughs> right. And by the way, uh, for those of you with research tonight, graduate students will be presenting their research. Uh, so come support and let's see what the new generation is interested in. <laughs>